All right. So we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, who is asking me about uh, the final exam? So it is on Thursday. It's the 27th, like you said. Okay. And it's our normal time meeting time. Um, right here, just like the midterm. It's a two hour time frame. Um, I still, I don't think I have it set up for us to do a take home portion there, but I'll double check that when we get a little closer. We're, we're about a week behind where I normally am. I say, say normally, but like I've been telling you, I haven't taught this class in five years. Um, so we're a little bit behind. So I don't think we're going to get to biochemistry or polymers. Um, we'll do next week will be a, um, a real brief intro to organic chemistry. We won't have a lab to go with it because we're going to finish this week's lab and use the time on your uh, research projects. Um, so you get open them in biochem is really more suited to the bio anyway. Um, when you get more into bio after you've had OCHEM, biochem makes a lot more sense. Um, we wouldn't be doing anything that you wouldn't be relearning in an upper division bio class anyway. So uh, we're not really losing out on that much other than synthesis of aspirin and caffeine extraction. It doesn't always work. So just an art, this is the PR thing that's chemist responding to the other I'll have to look that one up. That sounds like that sounds like one of the all right, so stuff we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to talk about coordination compounds in just in real basic terms. So this is like I've, I've mentioned before. Um, most every lot, or most every chapter that we cover in this entire year-long series is its own upper division course, practically, um, if not several courses in some cases. Um, coordination compounds show up in um, upper division inorganic chemistry. So an inorganic is really just the catch-all term to differentiate from chem most chemistry from organic chemistry. Um, so inorganic chemistry typically is dealing a lot with transition metals, metals in general, and how metals interact um, with solvent molecules, sometimes how they interact with carbon-based molecules. We'll see some of that today. Um, but this is really just kind of sort of pique your interest, um, give you some, some basic ideas, basic concepts that do show up in things like biochemistry. There are some biochemistry applications we'll talk about today. Um, but I don't, I don't remember seeing this in Gen Chem when I was a student. I was also not a great student when I was 19 taking this class. Um, so it's possible we went over it and I just, wasn't there that day, um, as that happens sometimes. Um, but anyway, the, the point is, if you wind up taking an upper division in organic class, all of these concepts will come back and you do see aspects of it um, in both in organic chemistry and in biochemistry, because what we're gonna talk about today is a lot of, of um, a lot of Lewis acids versus Lewis bases, which is, means we're talking about acids and bases, not in terms of uh, protons, but in terms of electrons. Um, and basically everything just flips. If a, if a Bronsted-Lowry acid is a proton donor, a Lewis acid is an electron acceptor. Um, and we'll talk about why that makes sense and why that's not contradictory here a little bit as well. Um, but basically, the same coordination compounds that we're going to be talking about today are the same types of bonds and complexes that you wind up making that kind of holds all of the metal ions that are present in, in living cells um, are all mostly held in place. They're either freely floating around as, um, as just ions that are kind of regulating the, the pH or regulating the you know, um, voltage potential across the cell membrane in the case of stuff like 
sodium ions or potassium ions, but more commonly, more metals are found as these complexes and things like iron ions bound to hemoglobin molecules. Um, copper ions are bound to enzymes as part of the electron transport chain. Manganese does the same thing. Um, pretty much most of the quote unquote minerals that are, that are required in dietary requirements um, are metal ions that are required to, to they basically stick in the middle of certain enzymes to cause certain processes to happen. They're, carbon is great and well and versatile and everything, but there's some things where you actually need metals and be able for them to work in living cells. Um, so we're going to get into just some of the theory for why that is. Um, transition metals do this a lot because of their partially built D orbitals. They wind up making a lot of these complexes. Um, and really, like I mentioned in lab, it's these coordination compounds are another way of looking at those complex ions um, that we that we talked about with the KF values. So KF is for the formation, is the equilibrium constant for the formation of these coordination compounds or of these complex ions. Um, so we're just going to go into more about what they are and what they do um, in, in today's lecture. And we do see that because of the partially filled D orbitals in, uh, in those transition metals, we do tend, they do tend to be colored um, and absorb light in the visible region. That's, that's a pretty small energy gap that leads to things being absorbing or fluorescent in the visible region. You have to have energy levels that are pretty close together, um, which is why D orbitals wind up working out really well then, because a D orbital and a P orbital so the 3D orbital and the 2 in the 4P orbital are really close in energy, um, close enough that a small gap that's fall where the photon would fall into the, the visible spectrum. Um, most electronic transitions um, of, of metals, especially, tends to be well into the UV or the X-ray region. They're a lot further apart. Um, and that's why we, we see a lot of transition metals in things like dyes and ceramic glazes. Um, they, we get a lot of these because they have those partially filled D orbitals. And a lot of times we can actually tweak those energy levels, just like we were talking about with the doping with, with semiconductors. We can tweak the energy levels here by switching out what, um, what, compounds are making these complex ions with the metals. So for instance, copper, copper two is, a, is bright blue when it's surrounded by water molecules. But if you surround it by methanol molecules, you get like an emerald green color from the same ion because the interactions between the molecules around the metal and the metal and the metal atoms D orbitals wind up forming different wavelength light. <laughs> Um, and so the, the general gist of these coordination compounds is that if you have a metal ion floating around in a solvent, um, that typically only really works if your solvent is polar. If your solvent has unpaired electrons, especially, um, because you need to do something that's going to pr produce some attractive force between the solvent molecules and the, and the metal mo um, ions. Otherwise, it'll just stay as an ionic compound and not dissolve. So we, if we have a solvent around like water or ammonia or methanol or anything that's polar that has some attractive force to a metal ion, that's going to sort of create this general shape where it, usually it's with them where you have a metal ion surrounded in sort of a general octahedral shape. You go back to your Vesper geometries from, from Chem 1. Um, this should look familiar, right? Everybody should be able to visualize this geometry using those wedges and dashes. Um, and it kind of makes sense that if you put a positive ion in the middle of a bunch of water molecules, they're all going to sort of arrange themselves so that the partial negative part of the water molecule is pointed towards that metal atom in the middle because it's got a positive charge. Um, and But what goes a little bit further than that is we kind of would just talk about it in general terms before, but it turns out that those bonds that it makes are actually fairly strong bonds. They're not quite equivalent bonds, but the, those metal atoms have empty orbitals 
around them, and it can kind of accept electron density from the water molecules around them. And that makes it almost as strong of, as an acid-base reaction as far as how, how strong of an uh, attractive force you get here. You get pretty strong forces, and that's why we actually wind up representing these as a chemical reaction, forming these from just, say, cobalt 2 floating around on its own. Um, and so the number of ion of um, things attached to that metal atom is called the coordination number. How many other things are forming these attractive forces with that metal ion? And so in general, for, or at least for this class, it's always going to be a metal ion in the middle. And then it's going to be surrounded by things that have electrons, free um, electrons, lone pairs. Um, and the things that are surrounding it are called ligands. This term, uh, this term here is pronounced ligand. Um, although I have, I guess I have heard it said that people say ligand before. Um, when I first learned it, I learned it as ligand. Um, doesn't really matter. If you say either one, people know what you're talking about and they've had, had a course in this. Um, and so that all the coordination number really is, is it's just a, an integer value. It's just how many things are attached. It's nothing, no complication, no calculations required. The coordination number for this complex um, is six. Right? And it gets a little bit tricky. It seems like everything should be able to make this octahedral shape. Um, but the actual number of free orbitals and the and the actual shape of those orbitals will dictate that sometimes you don't actually get a coordination number of six every time. Um, that's not something I'm going to have you like, memorize necessarily. That it can be explained through the shapes of the orbitals, but in general, um, you know, it's going to be something where I'll well, are where I will tell you. Okay, the coordination number is this. What's the formula? Or um, I'll give you the diagram and ask you what the coordination number is, what the geometry looks like. Lucas? Yeah, the silver and ammonia, would the ammonia be considered one ligand or with the hydrogen smooth? How did that separate? So the, the ammonia, the nitrogen, the entire ammonia molecule is one ligand attached. We're talking about how many things are attached to the metal, not how many things are attached there. So it would be two. So it would just be two. Um, and that's the sort of thing where, where we actually could do a Lewis dot structure for this um, and look at, are there any lone pairs on that silver? Is it linear or is it going to be bent? In this case, I believe silver is linear. Um, but like copper, when it's used around with chlorides, winds up making this um, tetrahedral shape. It still follows all of our safety Vesper rules. It's just a little bit trickier because um, we're actually, we're, filling in those empty orbitals instead of just looking at how many electrons are present. We're basically looking at, well, not just how many electrons are present around that metal atom, but how much empty space do they have around that metal atom. So it gets a little bit trickier. Um, but in general, I think most of the, the metal atom, metal ions that wind up making these coordination compacts complexes um, don't have really any lone pairs. They're all present as the ion form of the metal. And so they, they, and what makes something a metal is the fact that it gives away electrons to become more stable, right? So for in general, I don't think that we're gonna have any lone pairs around most of these metal ions. It's possible that there could be some other ones. Um, The other thing, let's see. Um, before we get into some more vocab, the other thing to look at here is that we have we basically have one charge for the entire complex. This is all considered one one compound here, one ion, um, and so these. We basically just get the overall charge for that entire thing by just summing up the charge of the pieces. If silver's got a plus one charge and ammonia is neutral, then you've got a plus one charge, this is plus a zero, plus a zero. 
So your overall charge is still plus one. But copper, on the other hand, copper can be a plus one or a plus two when it's when it's uh, an ion. But if it's surrounded by chlorides, fluoride is always going to be a minus one. So if you've got four chlorides, that's a total of minus four. The overall charge is two minus. What's the charge have to be on the copper? It's got to be a plus two. But it's as simple as we just sum these up. We're just getting to the point now where when we were talking about ionic compounds, that was really easy because everything had to add up to zero, right? With these, that's not the case. But now we have a little bit more background where we can say, okay, well, not, not everything has to add up to zero, but I know the chloride's always minus one and I can work backward from there. Um, and luckily, a lot of these ligands wind up being neutral, in which case it doesn't change the charge at all. Um, turns out ligands themselves can be fairly complicated, though. The simplest ones that are only attached in one place um, are called monodentate. So a monodentate ligand means that you're out of your water molecule. The water molecule has two lone pairs. One of those lone pairs is forming a bond with the cobalt. It's bound in one place. There's only one bond between this molecule and cobalt. The fact that we have this term implies that some ligands um, are polydentate. Polydentate ligands are more complicated and they tend, they're not they tend to, they are um, larger molecules typically that have more than one lone pair and those lone pairs are in more than one physical location on the molecule. Like water has two lone pairs on the oxygen, but they're both on the oxygen, right? So they're physically limited to only making a bond in one place spatially. Some of these, these larger ligands, like ethylene diamine, which is often just abbreviated uh, EN, lowercase EN, um, it has two different lone pairs, and there's a physical separation, there's a spatial separation between those two lone pairs, which means that this one molecule can bond to a cobalt in two different places. Instead of having a water molecule and a separate water molecule, next, let's see. Yeah, you wind up with one molecule attached to the cobalt in two places, one, two which makes it look a whole lot more complicated, doesn't it? Um, it's still the same thing we're talking about. And it, it becomes a little bit easier to see if I just, maybe if I just take this, if, if that's a nitrogen and a nitrogen, that's a carbon and a carbon, and those are attached. It's still attached the same way. We still had an overall octahedral shape around that cobalt. It's just the things that are attached to that cobalt are themselves attached as well. So you get these sort of these ring structures out of it. Um, and if you do that three places on the cobalt, you wind up with three ligands, but they still have a coordination number of six on that cobalt. The cobalt is still attached to six different lone pairs. It's just that each of those lone pairs is or two of those little pairs could be a part of the same overall molecule. Um, and that same logic can, can expand further. Um, you can actually have, a, if you have a really large molecule, this is called a heme complex, where if you take the iron out, you just have a bunch of nitrogens with lone pairs, and the nitrogens lone pairs, each of these nitrogens is, is uh, trigonal planar with their lone pairs pointed in the same general space. It's this empty space in the middle. Just scratch that out. If you remove the iron from the heme complex, you get a totally different molecule that's called a porphyrin ring. Let's see if I can spell it right. Or 
for in. Yeah. In this porphyrin ring, there's these lone pairs that are all spatially pointed in the same direction. And you can wind up with, it, with an iron sitting right in the middle there, sort of held in place by these uh, attractive forces. But then you wind up with that being tetradentate ligands. That's one molecule that's connecting to the iron in four different places. Um, and that winds up being really important because where do heat complexes show up in biology? Any guesses? But hemoglobin is basically an enzyme that's dis that is structured so that it can hold on to four of these heme complexes at a time. Each of those heme complexes has a place for an oxygen atom to bind. Um, basically makes the coordination, the coordination number of, um, of the iron ion is in the middle here. Right now, the way it's drawn, it's got a coordination number of four. In hemoglobin, there's actually one other side chain from an amino acid that goes kind of underneath. If you think of this, this whole complex as being a flat kind of square shape, underneath that, there's actually another amino acid that, that has a lone pair that can donate some electron density that gives it a, a coordination number of five. And then when oxygen comes in and attaches, it actually takes the coordination number of the iron up to six. And that makes it so that, that making these different complexes is what allows hemoglobin to transport oxygen from one part of the body to another. It's, it's literally just making one of these same complexes. It's just much more complicated system than even than, than this. Um, and if you, it's another vocab term here. When you make one of these complexes where you have um, a bunch of uh, polydentate ligands or one polydentate ligand surrounding a metal ion, they call that a keel, that entire complex is called a keeling. Um, I believe that comes from a Greek word, which is why we, why we don't pronounce it a chelate, the chelate. Um, and if you've ever heard of chelation therapy, was sort of a hot topic and you know, like a trendy health trend for a while. Um, I think people, there's still a chelation therapy lounge or something um, in, uh, in Reno. Uh, basically, chelation therapy is, that, is the medical way of treating um, heavy metal poison. Basically, you take a polydentate ligand, most specifically one, um, most commonly one that's called EDTA, which is ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. So it's this molecule, except that each of the nitrogens then has um, another to another molecule attached to it. And so you wind up making it so that one molecule, um, one ligand can make, I think it binds in six places to heavy metals. And what that does is it basically draws the heavy metals out of your cells and out of these enzymes it makes it water soluble so that your body can get rid of it through your kidneys, through your urine. Um, and so it's very effective at removing metals from enzymes. So it's a great way if you have um, some heavy metal poisoning or heavy metal toxicity that's built up over time. This is the way they treat it is they just give you an IV filled with EDTA a few times a week for a month or until you, you've um, removed enough of the heavy metal. Um, the problem with it, doing it, I won't call it recreationally, but over-the-counter self-diagnosed, I need my chelation therapy so that I can do a cleanse and cleanse myself of toxins. Yes, it does do that. Um, but unless you have a regular exposure to heavy metals, you're mostly removing the, eye, the metal ions that are supposed to be in your body. Um, it will also remove copper and iron. will make you anemic. Um, it's doesn't really discriminate what metal it's pulling out. It is really it binds preferentially to metals about the set the size of uh, lead, um, but it also will pull out all these beneficial, necessary nutrients from your from your body as well. Um, so don't I, don't. I guess I won't give medical advice, but I would say talk to your doctor about whether chelation therapy is right. <laughs> Stay away from poop. 
Um, one of the other things that makes these even more complicated is that not all of the ligands need to be the same. You can have one complex that has two different ligands. This one has one chlorine atom and then five ammonias around the same metal ion. And so really you have an ongoing equilibrium process. Anytime you put a metal ion dissolved in water, almost every metal ion that dissolves in water does make a complex like this with water. Um, and I think this is cobalt pentaamide, not pentaamine, but that's beside the point. Um, and so, but there's always going to be a, a series of, of equilibrium reactions. So you can have, say, copper, copper hexa, hexahydrate, two plus, and the way we usually write these with the brackets so that, um, to indicate that this is one complex is going to be in, if you add chloride to this system, there's going to be an equilibrium reaction between six waters around one copper and a complex that looks like one chlorine and then five waters. And that whole thing is going to be a plus one. Uh -huh. That whole thing is going to be a plus one. And then that has an equilibrium reaction where if you've replaced two of the water molecules with chloride. And so each of these is going to have its own, its own KF value, its own equilibrium constant. Um, and depending on the size of those equilibrium constants and the concentrations, you get one, one form of the copper complex, the copper chelate, that is more dominant, if you want to use that term, than the rest. And this is why... Think back to the cation um, lab where you had to get the pH just right in order for the aluminum to precipitate out. We had that issue with a bunch of the groups, right? Where we made it too basic. We wound up with the aluminum staying dissolved, staying soluble, right? So basically by adding too much hydroxide, we shifted the equilibrium so that it didn't favor making the solid, it favored making the um, aluminum complex ion instead. And so a lot of times these concentrations, these are all ongoing equilibrium processes that are constantly changing. Is there anything more? Um, so how do we how do we actually name these? Basically, we just say what's there and we use prefixes to say how many. This is a little bit like covalent compound name nomenclature where you you physically or not physically, you just literally said how many of everything you had, like dinitrogen pentoxide. You just use those prefixes to say how many because you there's no way just based on charges to know what complex you're you're forming. Um and we just if there's more than one different um different ligand attached. Then we just say, we just specify and say, okay, well, this is cobalt pentaamine, pentaamino bromo, bromo pentaamino cobalt two or cobalt three. We say we kind of combine our two forms. It's a little bit, I guess, it's probably more like the hydrate nomenclature where you use the hydrate, the prefixes to say how many. You still have to say what the charge was on the metal ion. And so the the I guess I I skipped ahead to nomenclature. We'll go back in a second. And so each of these different these different ligands has its own you know prefix that we go along with it. Um, if we have a chlorine, the chloride actually say chloro. If we don't have a prefix on this list, like for the ethylene diamine down here, we just say ethylene diamine. And so if I wanted to name this first one, ethylene diamine is neutral. There's two of them. So the charge on the copper has got to be plus two, right? And so the way that we write this, this will be similar to the way we write the name for organic compounds that we'll talk about next week. Um, 
We start by saying it's copper two. Once we know what the charge is on the copper, we start by just writing copper two. And then we're going to do everything else is going to amend that. By, we're going to amend it by adding prefixes. So we kind of work from right to left when we're writing these names out. Say the name of the metal ion that's in the middle. And then you work backwards say, okay, well, it's got ethylene dynamine and there's two of them. So we just literally say di ethylene dynamine. I didn't leave myself enough space. So diethylene diamine co copper two ion would be the name for that compound. Um, although there are a few cases that are different, we don't say hydrate. For water, we say aqua. Um, the other thing is if it's a polydentate ligand, we use a different set of prefixes. Most common, which is um, this or tris or two or three. If there's two of them. So the more correct name here would not be die. I just use die because that's the prefixes we're used to. It would be bis, ethylene, diamine, copper, two. But that's, that's literally what you it's, So there's some vocab involved with knowing these. Um, and I believe what I've done in the past is make put this um, table in the supporting information on the final. Um, Thanks. You still have to know how to use it, obviously, but that does simplify things a lot, right? Um, all right, and then if there's more than one different thing attached, we just find both of them on here. So CO is carbon monoxide, right? Carbon monoxide is neutral. And I believe, and there it is, we use the term carbonyl. And then we also have an NO2 group. An NO2 group, instead of nitrato, it's nitrito, just because it's nitrite instead of nitrate. And so all of our polyatomic ions that I'm sure everybody fully remembers from when you had to memorize it back in October, everybody still remembers all of those, right? They're all fair game for this. And basically you just drop the E at the end and put an O instead for most of them. Um, there's a few of them that are a little bit different, but look, there's oxalate. When it's a ligand, it's oxalato. Um, it's also a good place for getting names for Dungeons and Dragons characters. So you start pulling stuff out of your chemistry textbook. Um, Biz Oxalato, what are you doing here? Uh, so for the rest of this one, so we, if we're looking at this, a carbonyl group is neutral. Nitrite is a minus one, and there's three of them. So what is the charge on the manganese here for B? There's three nitrites, they're all minus one. The overall charge is the plus two, so the manganese has to be what? Plus five. So we start by writing the name of the ion, of the, the in organic chemistry, we call it the parent molecule. In this case, it'd be, it'd be like the parent ion. The manganese five. And then we're just gonna add the prefixes and say, Tricarbonyl and then just so we don't have the same prefix twice, they have the most correct way to do it would be that then use tris nitro nitrido. Tricarbonyl tris nitrido manganese five. Supposed to be NO3. No, there's three of them, but it's NO2. So it's nitrito, not nitrato. So as always with chemistry, we're really, really picky about our spelling and our and semantics. 
um, because we're trying to convey a whole bunch of information in a really small amount of space, right? So every letter counts in some cases. Um, and the difference between the nitrite and the nitrate, as we learned back with our polyatomic ions, is significant. Did that we on the carb carbon? No, sorry, that's okay. the carbon. That's this group, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. That's just a hyphen. Why? Um, because if you don't put hyphens in, you wind up with one giant long word that's hard to parse where the different prefixes begin and end. Um, so I tend to, every time I'm going from one prefix to another prefix, I use a hyphen to indicate that it's a different thing. And between the prefix and the um, I tend to do that as well, or sometimes it's just a space, but usually I put a, a hyphen there as well. Otherwise you get, Why don't try, you um, because it's easy to miss a space, especially when you're handwriting things. A uh, hyphen makes it really obvious. You can use an underscore just as effectively, but hyphens are more common. So, but tricarbonyl, tris, nitrito, space, manganese, five. That's even harder to parse than this is, right? Um, so I tend to just over hyphenate things. Um, as a way of making sure I'm seeing the distinct blocks of text for what they mean. Tris, does that mean three or does that mean the end? It means three. Okay. So the way you say Yeah. Like somebody is saying all these new try and tris and. Yes, uh, there's an updated. There's a, so, like your list of polyatomic ions. <laughs> Um, there's a fine line between being comprehensive and being overwhelming. Um, and so this examples of anionic ligands is far from comprehensive. The other table that I found uh, that I was looking at while I was prepping, let's see. If we don't have a table of new prefixes. We, we do, I'm just trying to decide how complex of one to give you. Um, So here are the other, if, you're, if it's a polydentate ligand, or if you already use the prefix di, then you use bis. If it's a, if it's a polydentate ligand, and you, or you already use the prefix tri, you use tris. And then there's tetra and tetricus, and penta and penticus. How do you know if they're going over a polydentate, like when you're writing these out, you have to do the most often. You kind of have to know coordination chemistry and know that ethylene diamine is going to generally be bidentate. Um, but you see how this, this page is pretty comprehensive about and gives lots of examples and everything, but it's also a little bit overwhelming. Um, so I'm trying to walk that fine line between giving you enough and giving you too much. Um, and that's in chemistry, when we have one lecture to cover this, that's kind of hard to know. It's like I said, I took a whole upper division course on this. Um, and at which point it was really easy. Will you give us on on chelates um, and ion complexes? But every class had its own nomenclature. Well, I think like with the simple ions, we named the metal first. But in these cases, there's all this stuff first, and then the metal is <laughs> And that seems like a clue, as well as it just being a really ridiculously long. Well, and the thing is, is that each of these can then make an ionic compound. So you can have, you know, tris carbonyl or tricarbonyl, tris nitrito, manganese 5 has a plus 2 charge. So you could actually have two chlorides attached to make it neutral and have a solid. Uh, that's what we did in lab today. 
because we made a complex ion that had an overall negative charge, minus two charge, and then added potassium ions because we're trying to make it form a solid. Um, and so our normal rules about ionic compounds when they're solids still apply here. We, we can take this. And then, so the full name in that case, we would, if this is the plus two charge, we had Cl2 attached there to, to balance out the charges. It would be tricarbonyl trisnitrido manganese five chloride. Yeah. It's just, we keep building layers upon layers of nomenclature. And we'll see this again with organic chemistry. Organic chemistry does the same thing where you build all of your standard rules that will establish at the beginning of organic chemistry still apply at the end of organic chemistry. We just have layers upon layers upon layers, um, which winds up getting really overwhelming sometimes, I realize. So I don't wanna to spend too much time on the nomenclature. We'll do some practice with it. Um, but it's really one of those things, the more time you spend with it, um, and the more, the better you know your polyatomic ions, the more this all makes sense, right? As long as you know the ending of your polyatomic ion, just like with the acid nomenclature, they all have their standard. If it ends in I, you just turn it to an O. If it ends in eight, it becomes eight O or auto, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, I turns into Ido or Ido. Will it be expected to memorize any list of polydendates? And will you give it to us if we are? Right now. Let's let's look at the study guide to the final and see what I what I did last time. Uh, So X is that OX? Yes. Ox. Well, oh, okay. sorry, as a that's oxalate. Okay. Where's my files? I like the obvious answer too. <laughs> it's all about context, right? Yeah. We're talking about Oregon Trail, it's clearly an ox. <laughs> He was. They have. You can. Um, you can play it as a flash game on online now. Um, and yeah, he still had fun. He kept dying, um, and he got in trouble in school because he was he was rafting down the river at the very end when his teacher told them to close their computers. Said, but I'm almost there, and he just ignored her. Um, he got in trouble because that's he exactly what I would have done. <laughs> but did he make it? He did make it, he yeah. Did. So he's like, that was worth it. Um, that was just said, yeah, that's what we're looking for. So we do name the structure and formula, and then we do some concepts questions when it comes to this. So I will give you the name, and can you draw the right structure from that name is going to be the way that we test this on the final. Right, so it's less about the way that we've just been doing it. And more, like if I say tricarbonyl trisnitrido manganese 5, can you draw that structure? Or if I give you this formula, can you draw it with the right structure? What's the coordination number? What part of the atoms is attached? And so we'll, we'll continue practicing with that because it is tricky. But it's going to be less, at least for me, it was always a lot easier to go from Oxalato to lithium to O four two minus than the other way around. Um, remembering that this was oxalato was always harder for me. Um, but we'll have we'll have a list of things that I will choose from. I'm not going to spring something new on you on the test. Well, um, drawing it, you want to draw it as like a continuous dot. So probably so that it looks something like that except with the atoms listed instead. So if you could go from this molecule, which we would name it as fluoro penta uh, mean, I think it's actually two M's in this case, cobalt three, 
you can go from that name to this. And show it as, okay, that's a wedge coming out of the board. Those are going into the board. Here's a wedge coming out of the board. These ones are in the plane of the board. So drawing that structure from the name or from the formula is what I mean. Will they be like blue pairs? Not on the ligands. I, I'm not looking. So I, I'm not looking for the complete structure. I, like I don't. You don't have to write. Um, you know, every lone pair on the chloride. I'm mainly interested in that metal ion and what's attached to the metal ion. Can you post another list of the polycomic ions? Just yes, to... we'll do that as well. So we have that to review from. Is it cobalt or cobalt blue? Because it's like the NH3 or one, one plus each. The NH3 are neutral. Ammonium NH4 doesn't have a lone pair, but that's got a plus one charge. So the ammonia are all neutral and the chloride's got a minus one charge. So <laughs> naming things is complicated and obnoxious. Um, let's practice just going from the formula to drawing the structures. And I'm gonna give everybody five minutes to work on this and then a 10 minute break. So we'll come back, build this into our break. You can take your break first and come back or vice versa. But we'll, I'll start working through these problems at five after. So I, I did say draw them. Um, as well, but the, the problem just says what's the oxidation and coordination over, but it's, it'd be good practice to draw them as well.
then we would just leave the isolation sphere. Mm -hmm. So the first one, oh. all the money of the Rami is just an hour. So oh, yeah, so it also needs our tools for it's not six, it's one of the six things. Yeah. I didn't know what I was going to do. I I that's how you that's why you have to find it. So I don't have a number. So it's whatever it's better is on all of your numbers. Yeah. So it'll be just minus one. But no, it'll be minus three. It'll be plus one. Yeah, I should be able to tell you. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Thing while we do that, I trying to get down. trying to get four or five thirty. Oh, it's just for the It's so It's shaded in the afternoon. I still get shot every time. I'll probably. I don't know. I would like to get back to talking. I see you know, I, so so that's what I'm saying. I like I block on what this is and I really need some points. Yes, you said that. Yeah. I would like to miss. So I'll let you know. I don't want you to get up. I got to say. I just want to like be familiar and that's what I'll talk about. Yeah. You probably will. Yay. All right. I'll probably I'll make it a pretty easy one. Yeah. Bye. Did you say is that uh, your last thing? Mm -hmm. Did you say those things are like if you're really sensitive to them? If you have a if you have a, a tolerance to caffeine, your Ramante can get around them. Um, yeah, that would, is that again? Because it's also caffeine, right? It's got caffeine, but it also has some other molecules that have mild stimulant properties. Uh -huh. Is it how um, the caffeine reacts with those molecules? No, it's just, it may, it's, if you got a tolerance to caffeine, then you got a tolerance to all stimulants to some extent. But different stimulants are going to hit the body in different ways because they have different mechanisms. Um, yeah. You can think about chemical chemical tolerance like um, like being in shape. Your body is really good at not responding to external stimuli like um, like exercise, for instance. But you can be in shape for running. And then still get super winded if you go climbing or if you go swimming, right? Mm -hmm. You're still going to do better than somebody that's not in shape at all. So it, it's basically giving your body a different kind of workout by having a slightly different type of, of stimulant. And it's still a pretty mild one, but but at least for me, I 
I found that um, my body, I can drink caffeine all day and I frequently do, and it just it's okay. I'm going to have a good day. Uh, a little bit. I'll get, I'll get the I'll get the shakes again. I don't usually get the shakes from caffeine anymore. But I don't know. Like a cotton thing is another thing. I feel like I get like a lot of like like a caffeine high up here from my days. Yeah, they don't have the new ones that have coffee, but they don't make me like jittery. It depends on the day when I'm already this sleep deprived and not this much going on. Um, it'll give me. I'll be a little bit jittery, but. That's better than being asleep. I have questions. Yes. Um, the assignment was due on Sunday. The last thing you said was estimate oh. the amount of required to complete each step in project. It's time. Sorry, estimate the amount of time okay. or or resources okay. in general. Uh, is just you know what we'll do is we'll, give, we'll put that into the into the uh, business category. Fill in the blank. <laughs> so it'll be the same. So basically, just write up a quick thing. Um, but we'll do that. Um, we'll just put the points for that. We'll go into quizzes. Okay, cool. So if you, so instead of that doing it, be our quiz, quiz. that'll be our quiz. All right, cool. Thank you. Oh, what's my question? Okay, so that's going to be separate. Not one person from the group treated it. Right. Oh, sorry, no. <laughs> Take that back. We're still like altering the same things pretty much. Um, yes, you all turn in the same thing, and it should be set up that way. Let's see what it looks like on the next side. Um, we will change the points to be worth 10, so it's not worth more than other quizzes. It's like, I don't know, just like we're supposed to be able to teach each other. I do that. I don't do that. Together on it to, to, to some extent, obviously. Um, but just, yeah, so just like a half page formalize and answer these few things. And we'll call that the quiz for this weekend. Uh, and then we each do that, right? So it'll be, you only need one person to upload it. Okay. So it is set up, everybody's in, in groups already. So I'm um, so it sh you should just be able to have one person just upload it for, for the entire group. I'm just operating under the assumption that that everybody has input in helping with it. When I'm talking it over, one person types it up. It's fine. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Question? Yeah. This is like way back for one of the ICAs. It was like an extra question, but got me really curious. Mm -hmm. It was uh, like a fuel cell. Oh. Yeah. So, my uh, was Delta P, mm -hmm. that that's you know work done. So I got that. Very close. Mm -hmm. well, it was going to be something a little bit was, Do you have to like, yeah. like this is per mole? I wasn't sure like if you have to. Like, yes. So do. Okay. So this this is joules per mole of the reaction. Okay. Yeah. So gotcha. if you have, um, if the reaction is balanced mm -hmm. differently than just one to one as well, you also have to factor that in. Okay. So it's like, okay, for, if that's joules per mole reaction, then that's this many joules per mole of hydrogen. Okay. Makes sense? Yeah. But it goes all the way to one, one, one. Correct. Okay. So this is the same number in joule per mole oxygen. But this is Jules per mole. Uh, we have our like progress report for the weekend. Um, okay. um, I can and I always write it out as a conversion to make sure I'm not the whole time I'm supposed to divide. Yeah. One mole of reaction okay. is so two moles of yeah. hydrogen. Right. Okay. So I did it. It's a number. Yeah. And that's I, I, I always. Before I divide, I still always have to write it out. Which one I should be a problem? Like if you're trying to. It depends on what you're trying to do. Okay. And how you have the problem. So if you're trying to find moles of hydrogen, then it would. Yeah. So basically, you're going to say, okay, if I want this many joules, yeah. I need, you know, yeah. x times 10 to the 24 yeah. joules. 
then this would be flipped, then this would be flipped. I don't see other than that. Right, so then you get joules. Okay, if I need that many joules, this is that many right. moles of reaction, and that many moles of reaction, and that many moles of hydrogen. But I, there's a reason that we emphasize using conversions for solving word problems so, so um, strictly and generally, and it's because it keeps you from those. Those dumb, I multiply by a thousand when I'm supposed to divide by a thousand. Yeah, sure. errors. Sweet. Okay. Yeah, that was a problem before. Yeah, I didn't care. She was there. Right. It's just a matter of what makes the most sense to you. And I was really thinking about that. I mean, I had a little bit of with my shoes and when I was like running a mandatory like using a mile like Sam D. Yeah, like a stumble. Yeah, I had a big influence. Yeah, these start. I got these for like 30 bucks this year at a trading post. They're like, uh, like all made of all recycled material. It smells like shrimp, but they start actually really quickly. But I was playing pickleball the other day and I like took a step and I almost ate shit because I. That thing pulled it over. So you get to play pickleball. Right. So you get to play pickleball. Dude, pickleball's pretty fun. Just tennis, but like worse. No, no you can say the same thing about table tennis. Yeah. You'd be wrong. Yeah. You think the same thing about it. <laughs> I haven't played pickleball. I don't really have a horse in this race, but I do love table tennis. It's a lot easier to drink. While you're playing table tennis, and I assume pickleball, oh, then you start actually. Whatever I do, it's like right to the edge table. It's just like, you know, you yeah, should make small. Yeah, yeah. 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 So you just want to. Yeah. We offered, we offered table tennis here at the college <laughs> uh, because saying we offered a course in ping pong sounded less professional. <laughs> It's like, I don't like I don't like round. Like, 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 that said, I don't think I ever finished Super Troopers 2. I didn't watch it. I saw like the first half of it and it lost interest. But yeah, it looks like uh, it, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't grab me. I mean, like, I more kids that I'm you know. But did you ever watch Club Dread? No, I haven't seen that. That was that was pretty good. It's the Broken Lizard. It was before Super Troopers. They had a, um, a comedy. Is a little bit like scary movie. It's their take on a um, satire of slashers. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's Broken Lizard, not you know, the Fairly Brothers or the yeah. scary movie. Uh, the better. Main brothers. Yeah. Uh, I keep getting recommended this one called Slam and Salmon, but not by anybody. It's just on. It's just on uh, Amazon. That one. You just never. I never know. I was like, is it going to be funny? Yeah. And then the super troopers or like, yeah, what's up? Yeah. I like Fear Fest a lot. I think Fear Fest is hilarious. Yeah. 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 Same, same guy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's look at a few of these. So for the cobalt three, enta amine. Um, bromo cobalt, penta amine bromo cobalt three complex. What's the oxidation state on the cobalt? I just gave it the name, so plus three, right? Um, the bromide is minus one, the amine is neutral, and they all add up to plus two. So if you think algebraically, you can write it as an algebra. Equation, but since we're dealing all with integers here, it's usually pretty easy to just do it in your head. Um, what's the coordination number? Six. Six. It's got six things attached to it. As far as what does this look like? That's the one from that that I just drew right here, except with the bromine instead of the chlorine. So something like that. You don't need to draw the lone pairs there. But something that shows 
that you understand that if it has a coordination number of six, it's going to have an overall octahedral shape. Right, so just showing the octahedral nature of that. Like I said, though, the way this question is written, you don't need to draw it for this one. I'm just giving us more practice. What's the oxidation state on the iron in B? Two plus. Two plus, because the cyanides are all minus one, right? So, and then you've got six of them, which can, again, makes our coordination number the same. We're gonna find that it's, this, it's really similar coordination numbers tend to be even, and they tend, so they tend to be two, four, or six. And if we we're drawing this structure out, if it's coordination number is six, once again, it's going to be tetrahedral. Sorry, I just have it. Right. Hexacyan? Hexacyano iron two. So remember anything ends in ide? We drop the ide and just put an O in its place. So cyanide becomes becomes cyano. Chloride becomes chloro. How do we know which end of the cyanide attaches to the iron? If we look at the Lewis dot structure for cyanide, it looks like this, right? Why is it, I'm sorry, why is it NC and then CN? Because I'm showing what's attached. Well, the part that's attached, the nitrogen's not back. So My question, how do I know that? Does it feel like the nitrogen? So like with the carbon? Um, it's, it's not the electronegativity because electronegativity, nitrogen is more electronegative. So that would mean that, I guess you could think of it, it works backwards through logic. You could say that nitrogen is more electronegative and therefore less likely to share. The way that I think about it is in terms of formal charge though. You have got a formal charge if, um, on these, how many, you guys remember doing that with how many electrons is at home versus the, on the periodic table? How many electrons does this carbon have? Five. And how many does it have on the periodic table? Four. So it's got one extra electron. So that's got a formal charge of minus one versus the nitrogen also has five electrons, but it has five on the periodic table as well. So the nitrogen's got a formal charge of zero. So one with the negative charge is more likely, is going to be more attracted to the iron, and you, but you can absolutely also think of it as the the element that is more electronegative is less likely to share. Um, but the other reason this is worth bringing up is because this there is a form of this. This is there's actually an equilibrium process where these cyanides are flipped, or one of them is flipped. And if it's flipped the other way so that the nitrogen is attached to the iron instead of the other way around, that's isocyano. Um, but we're not going to get into that in too much detail other than understanding that it exists um, at, at this point. Um, how about C? What's the oxidation state on the cobalt? Two plus. What's the oxidation state on each oxalate? Oxalate is C2, or sorry, C2O4, not H4. It's two minus. It's two minus. And there's three of them. So that's a total of minus six. So the charge on the cobalt has to be plus two. What's the coordination number on the cobalt going to be? Remember how I said coordination numbers generally tend to be even? What could ox what does oxalate look like as a structure? Uh, 
oxalates bidentate. Because each of these oxygens has a negative charge can attach to the cobalt. So it's actually, the coordination number is actually going to be six. There's only three oxalates, but each oxalate is bound in two places. So you wind up with something that looks like So one oxalate there's an oxalate attached to the cobalt in two places. Each of the three oxalates will do the same thing. So just like the ethylene diamine that we saw before. So part of this is knowing which one of these, which of these are um, bidentate versus which ones are monodentate. Um, and in general, if the larger the molecule, the more likely it is to bind in more than one place. So you, you literally can't have bromide be bidentate because it's one atom, right? And even, the, even cyanide is still only two atoms. It has two long pairs on two different atoms, but they're geometrically opposite from each other. So um, it, oxalate and ethylene diamine are the ones to watch out for. Those are the ones that show up all the time that are bidentate. Um, the rest of this structure would then look like, try and draw this, showing the whole structure, but also So would it be six? So the coordination number would be six, because it's got six things attached to it, even if it's only three links. And so I would say that they are covalent like bonds. Or They're stronger than just regular hydrogen bonds, stronger than regular intermolecular forces. They're yeah. approaching the strength of a covalent bond. So we typically draw them as covalent bonds as well. How about palladium tetra or tetrachloral palladium? What's the charge on the palladium? Charge of the palladium has got to be plus two. And then what's the what's the geometry? When, what's the coordination number first, I guess? Four. And in this case, if the coordination number is four, that tells us that it's going to be tetrahedral. What makes that complex, though? The fact that the palladium has empty orbitals and a positive charge, and the chlorides have negative charges, so they're drawn with a positive charge. Um, if we go, go back and looking at this one, this is the reason I, I, I said we're going to talk about Lewis acids, and I haven't talked about Lewis acids at all yet, um, is because when you make these bonds here, you pull electron density from the oxygen and put it towards that positive charge in the middle, which actually weakens these bonds. So you actually wind up increasing the number of, of H pluses in a solution by adding a metal ion to it. Metal ion doesn't have any H pluses, so how do you increase Number of H pluses, how do you make something more acidic without adding something with H pluses? Well, when you do this, it weakens this bond, which means that the, the dissociation of that bond that increases that equilibrium constant. And so you actually can wind up with some of these water molecules turning into hydroxides and releasing an H plus. 
So it is really similar to a covalent bond. We just, we started off defining covalent bonds by saying covalent bonds have to be between two, between two non-metals, right? Well, as with everything that you've learned in this class, that's a generalization. Then we added the polar bonds, right? Well, really, as long as your electronegativity difference is under this threshold, then it can still be a covalent bond between a metal and a non-metal. This is another way that you can make a covalent bond between a metal and a non-metal, um, and it changes the pH of your solution as well. Um, basically, we just keep adding layers of, um, of complexity here, right? We start removing assumptions. Um, the general, the, the joke among chemists and chemistry students is that every year you have to unlearn what you learned last year and then learn it a different way. It's not wrong. It's not that we're teaching you things that are wrong initially. It's that we're teaching you generalizations while you get the hang of things and we start removing those scaffolds, removing those crutches um, as we get more and more complicated. So don't blame me when you have to relearn all of this in a year or two. Um, that's just the way that you have to learn how math works, how you have to learn how science works to get progressively more complicated. All right. D is a really fun one. D is two coordination complexes forming an ionic compound with each other, one with a positive charge and one with a negative charge. So you get an ionic compound made up of two of these individual coordination complexes. Um, and it's really a pain in the ass to me. So let's try it. You just go left or right? So I would name them separate. As soon as I say that there's two coordination compounds there, I'm gonna name the first one and then I'm gonna name the second. Um, so this one here, that's a cobalt. Actually, I would name the second one first because we don't know the charge on the cobalt yet. You can guess what the charge. Actually, we don't have a way of figuring this out <laughs> because the cobalt could be plus two or plus three and the or plus four, and the iron could be either plus two or plus three, which means this whole complex could be, could sum up to minus three or minus four. So we actually don't have a way to, to write out the oxidation state. Not enough information is given to know what the oxidation states are here. We can still name it without the oxidation states though. We can still say that this first one is tris, Ethylene diamine cobalt and the second one is going to be hexacyano iron. Test, are you going to give us the ethylene diamine or, or is it going to be written as EN? It'll be written as, as EN like this. Um, the formula for it is, I think it's on one of the later slides, but it's written as NH2CH2CH2NH2. You don't want to write, you want, and you have to write it out like this. So, and you can't combine them because you need it to be clear that the two nitrogens are on opposite sides of the molecule and how they're attached um, in order for it to be the right molecule. So, EN is easier. Um, so, here's some more examples. And these are specifically examples in which the complex is a cation. Typically, you'll see the, the complex is a cation um, 
when you have mostly ligands that are neutral. Because most of your ligands, for them to be ligands, they have to have lone pairs or negative charges in order for it to work. Um, and so you can't really have a ligand that's positive because there's no attractive force between a positive molecule coming up to another positive ion, right? They're going to repel each other, not form a complex. So your ligands tend to be neutral um, or negative. And if your overall complex has a positive charge, and that usually means your ligands are neutral, or at least that you have more neutral ligands than negative ligands, like this case. Ah. This one has two fluorides as part of the complex, but it also has four waters. The overall charge on this complex if it's got one fluoride balancing it out, it has to be a plus one. So in this case, in most cases, you can work out, work backwards to figure out what the oxidation state is. That nomenclature example we just did, though, is one of the weird cases where um, because there are two possible options that would both give you um, a real answer, we can't work out the charge exactly. And this, yeah, there it is. This is why we don't typically write out ethylene diamine's formula, um, because wouldn't that look a lot nicer if it was just cobalt En3, 2, SO4, 3? That's still not much better, but it's, I guess it is, it is much better. It's still a lot, but it's much better than it is right there, right? Not charge? No, it's neutral. So oxalate is bidentate with a negative two charge. Ethylene diamine is bidentate neutral. Does that have long pairs? So it seems like it's often used. It does. Those nitrogens each have a lone pair. Each of those nitrogens. So the carbons in the middle don't, but the nitrogen has a lone pair. So that's why it's used. And EDTA is even better because it's hexadentate, not just bidentate. It actually can make a complex, it can give a coordination number six all by itself. Um, and that, that one is, it looks like ethylene diamine with the two lone pairs. Except that each of these nitrogens is then attached to an acetate. So ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid is the name of is the whole name for ETA. And it's because you wind up with. this monster, and then the same on this side. So you can see how this molecule being this big with this many negative charges and lone pairs, it basically envelops a positive charge a um, metal ion, it just completely surrounds it with electron density, and you get one complex that has a coordination number of six and is still highly soluble in water. However, in this class, we're mostly going to use eth ethylene diamine was used before they discovered EDTA. Um, now that we have EDTA, so ethylene diamine still does occasionally get used as a, as a um, prescribed medication for, for heavy metal toxicity, but EDTA is just far more effective. Um, right, and then there's just a couple examples where if you happen to have the right charges and the right ratios, you can wind up with an overall complex that's neutral that won't make a further ionic compound. 
So if the platinum's got a plus two or a plus four and you've got four chlorides, there's no net charge here. So this just makes a relatively stable compound on its own. We don't think of it as being an ionic solid though, because it stays dissolved in water. So it's it's an ionic, it's kind of like an ionic compound, but it's more, it's this complex thing. They use complex in both meanings of the word. Complex, like it's a big object made of smaller objects, but also complex in the fact that it's more complicated. Um, it is an ion floating around, still soluble in water, that's neutral. And then obviously you can have the opposite case of up here. If you've got a whole bunch of chlorides surrounding something, you can wind up with an overall negative charge. Um, and these overall negatives, they do to indicate that it's negative. One of the things that, that does get used is they'll just throw eight on the end. So instead of saying it's hexachloro platinum, platinum six ion, I'm okay saying platinum six ion. So you don't need to worry about this eight here, but I just don't want you to be confused when you see it. Um, because if you say hexachloro platinum four ion, I still know that it's this, right? The eight is not really serving any purpose to say that it's an eight. That makes sense to everybody. It's sort of redundant. If you know that it's platinum four and you know that there's six chlorides, you don't need to put eight to say that it's negative. Um, I guess that's mainly just crossing, on, crossing T's and dotting I's. So if you make an ionic compound out of this, you don't get something that ends in um since none of our ionic compounds end in um ever, they always end in eight, eight, or eight. Uh, but again, I'm not going to be picky about that. Uh, so there's more practice naming things here. And again, I'm thinking I'm going to give you all this is probably not going to be exhaustive, but it'll be enough for whatever's on the test so that you you have this um, or something that looks very similar to this. Um, and I'll probably all include ethylene diamine on there too. Um, the, and the trick with ethylene diamine is if, if it's something that you don't have a complex for or you don't have a name for, then just say the word ethylene diamine um, when you're when you're naming these. Like we did before, this would be Tris ethylene diamine cobalt. Oh, uh, Dr. Franz was like, I felt like a little bit a strict we're on spelling. Um my rule of thumb on spelling is that somebody else who took this class could read what you wrote and know what you meant. I'm usually not going to mark you down on spelling. You start getting into, I left off a whole syllable, or I sw switched out the P in platinum for an F. Um, all of a sudden, things get a lot more complicated, right? Um, so it's, it's, I don't have a hard rule on if you spell it wrong, I'm going to mark you down. It's, if you spell it real wrong, I'll mark you down. And that's sort of a, that's a fuzzy line. I know that's not necessarily helpful, um, but... You spell platinum with two T's. I'll forgive you that. Just don't call it platinum. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about isomers. Because isomers is kind of a concept we've been dancing around since we first learned about formulas and nomenclature. Um, but we haven't officially defined yet. So remember how a second ago when I said, well, with deadly dining, you have to write out the whole structure. You can't combine it, combine, combine it, because NH2, CH2, CH2, NH2. There's ethylene dining, so why not just write N2, C2, H8? Well, the reason is isomers. The reason is this formula could mean a lot of different structures. It could mean a lot of different molecules that have the same formula, but have the atoms connected in a different way. And so that's the definition of an isomer. 
An isomer is a compound that has the same formula, but different structure. And so it can mean a different order of atoms. It could mean that um, you know, if it was NH3, CH, CH, NH3, that's a different compound. You just attach the hydrogens to the different the nitrogens instead of the carbons in the middle, but that's going to have an overall different structure and different properties. We actually tried drawing that structure out. We'd have something that looked like H3. Something like this. Anyway, it makes the point that I'm trying to make. The structure would be a little bit different, actually. But um, the point I'm trying to make is that this is a different molecule than this. And the reason that we, and that's because it's a different isomer. Same formula, but with atoms connected in different ways. And to make things further complicated, there's different classifications of isomers. Um, the type of isomer I was just showing you is called a structural isomer. And they, the official definition is the atoms have different connectivities, which is a, a confusing way to say that different atoms are connected to different atoms. Same overall formula, but arranged in a different way. Um, and when it comes to coordination compounds, that can mean something like your ligand swaps with one of the ions that's just there to balance the charge. The, al the ions are just there to balance charge are called counter ions. So, for instance, if we had something like CuH2O, for Cl2. If we switched one of those waters for one of the chlorides, we could have Cu H2O 3 Cl Cl, where one of the chlorides is part of the complex, but one of the chlorides is just there to balance charge. Those actually behave differently, they have different chemical properties. Um, you can also have what are called linkage isomers. Linkage isomers is what we were talking about before with cyanide. When I said, okay, well, the, the carbon is, is bound to the iron middle. How do I know it's the carbon? Because the carbon has that negative charge, right? Um, if it flips around so that the nitrogen binds to the iron instead of the carbon, it's still an acting as a ligand. It's still the same molecule, same polyatomic ion acting as a ligand, but attached at the opposite end. And so that's called a linkage isomer. We changed what part of the ligand was attached to the iron or to the uh, metal ion in the middle. Those are the easy ones. Those ones kind of make sense. I can draw the molecules out pretty easily. Um, to show how that all works. These ones are a little bit more subtle. Geometric isomers and optical isomers are really tricky. One of the toughest concepts that you deal with in OCHEM 1 is the idea of an optical isomer. An optical isomer is none of these other isomers, but it's still not the same molecule. Um, an optical isomer means that you have, if you took a mirror image of the compound, it's not the same compound, uh, which is weird. Well, so. Pyrellic, exactly. It's like you try that. So in the ones that, the number one example of that is, if you look at your hand, you know right away looking at it, if it's your right hand or your left hand. If you look at somebody else's hand, you can look at that and you can say that's, that's their right hand or that's their left hand. How do you know? Their hands are mirror image of each other. They're identical, aren't they? Not quite. You can't put a right hand into a left-handed glove. And that's because it's not superimposable. They can be a mirror image, but not be the same thing. And that property is called chirality. And in, in chemistry, we also refer to those as optical isomers. 
And they're referred to as optical isomers. And this, this is kind of a cool, one of the ways they first figured out that this existed is that some compounds, when you shine polarized light on them, the polarized light rotates as it moves through the material. So if the polarized light means that the, um, the waves are all arranged the same way. So if, they're, if it's in the plane of the board and light is moving this way, if it hits an optical material, it'll rotate like this or like that. The direction, whether it rotates clockwise or counterclockwise, depends on which isomer you have. One isomer will rotate it clockwise, the other one rotates it counterclockwise, which is weird. Why is light interacting with matter in a way that rotates? Um, and it's tricky to explain, and it's really hard to wrap your head around. Um, but that's why it's referred to as optical isomers. Optical materials have that property of rotating polarized light. And optical materials in general are tidal. They are these non superposable mirror images. And if one of them rotates light one direction, the opposite, the mirror image will rotate light the opposite direction. Again, that's the most subtle one. And I'll show some examples of that in a minute. Um, Geometric isomers actually might even be easier to understand than linkage isomers. Geometric isomers basically refer to how your ligands are arranged around the central atom. So if we have, we we'll use copper again. Have this compound, dichloro tetra aqua copper. The two chlorides are on opposite sides from each other, right? They're, the angle between the two chlorides is 180 degrees, right? That's not the same compound as if you put one chloride up and one chloride 90 degrees from it. And kept everything else the same. Having the chlorines 90 degrees from each other instead of 180 degrees is a different compound. You can't take this one and rearrange it to make this without, without breaking one of these bonds, moving the chlorine and then reattaching, which makes it a different molecule. So this is an example of a geometric isomer. A geometric isomer means that everything's on the surface, everything looks the same, right? The copper's got the same number of bonds that everything is four, four oxygen to carbon bond or to uh, copper bonds and two chlorine to carbon bond. I'm saying that chlorine to copper bonds. But the fact that you can arrange them differently means that you have two different geometric isomers. And so we use the, the terms that we use to describe this. We just use, we just add one more prefix. Like I said, we're just going to keep adding layers to these names. And again, I'm not going to be that specific when it comes to your nomenclature problems on this test. I want you to understand that this process exists. And if I gave you these two, tell me which one is trans versus which one is cis. Trans means opposite, means across. Cis means on the same side. So because the two chlorine, they're not exactly on the same side, but they're in general facing kind of the same way. They're not opposite from each other is the big point here. Lucas, uh, how do you know which name to look at? Like, is it a different one on this transfer say it's like water versus chlorine? If you only have two of them, those are the two that you're going to look at. Uh an example of chlorination of isomers, would that be like the OH2 and the H2O? Um, if, if I actually flipped this around so that I was drawing so that the hydrogen is attached oh, okay, to the copper, but that can't really happen because you need a lone pair. Yeah. So something like cyanide group or a nitrate 
Nitrate has it, or uh, nitrite has a lone pair on the nitrogen, and then it also has lone pairs on the oxygen. So either the nitrogen or the oxygen could make a bond. And so specified, so that's an example. Is it the nitrogen that's attaching, or is it the oxygen that's attaching? Watch out. So something with two. Um, right. And so nit nitrites, um, sulfites, and cyanides are the most common ones for the, for the geometric. Or sorry, for the language isomers. Um, the other type of geometric isomers are base versus mer. Um, those ones are a little bit trickier. If you have three and three instead of four and two, if you have four and two, it's a cis versus trans. If you have three and three, you can either arrange them so that each three is are in a T-shape relative to each other. And then the corresponding ones would be, you can see how the chlorines are making, are in a T-shape relative to each other and so are the waters, right? That's the myrrh isomer. The face isomer puts all three of them in the same side molecule. So you get something like So you see how all three of the chlorines are all on the same side over here, and all three of the waters are on the same side. That makes it base. And it's kind of like that if you can arrange it so that it's like flipping a coin, you could either, if you grab, you looked at two sides of the molecule, you get the water side or the chlorine side. This one that's the mer, you can't do that because all of them are in the same plane. All three of the planes are in the same plane and are flat, and so you get these two perpendicular planes relative to each other. Instead of getting three waters and three chlorines on opposite sides. It's hard to see visually. This is one of the places where, where model kits can be really helpful too. So during lab next week, if this is concept that's tricky for you, we can get out the um, I'll bring in out some of the uh, molecular model kits because setting them up, it's actually really obvious to see in three dimensions what you're talking, what I'm talking about here. But just remember, if you can look at it and see a T shape, or the other way you can think about it is that if two of these are 180 degrees from each other, and two of these are 180 degrees from each other, versus over here, all three of the waters, none of the waters are 180 degrees from another water. And none of the chlorides are 180 degrees from another from another chloride. And so, how would I ask about this on a test? Basically, if I gave you two molecules, say, are they are they isomers? If so, what type of isomer, or are they the same molecule? So it's it's a tricky multiple choice question, but it's really a multiple choice question. It's either coordination isomer, language isomer, cis trans, base mer, optical isomer, or they're the same molecule, just drawn in a different way. That's actually kind of a tricky question to answer. It is multiple choice, but it's still hard to answer that, um, especially until you really get these definitions down. So we'll end there. We'll talk more about the, the isomers and what, there's more information about the different types and examples here. Um, this weekend, not uh, not a regular quiz, but there there's basically a progress update on your research project proposal. One person per group needs to upload it, but I assume everybody will work together in a group. Just a couple of quick questions. Just click on the assignment. It's due on Sunday. So what have you done? What do you still need to do? How much time is it going to take? Okay. Yeah.
Uh, if anybody's not busy after this class, I do have a speech that I need to give in the library. If anybody's interested in, in listening to the speech, um, you guys are more than welcome to come and put the speech on. It's about Woodstock 99. Oh, interesting. Okay. okay. Uh, well, then get up and make listen to speech if you've got the time. You guys don't have to come, obviously, but I just wanted to extend the invitation. I 